But uh, so welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is October thirtieth. Uh, not quite Halloween. Um, so, but <clears throat> Chad thinks it is. But um, <laughs> at any rate, um, we are celebrating um, Connected Educators Month, um, and right at the end of it. And we're looking back at CL MOOC and looking forward to making MOOC and figuring out MOOC and what did we learn from CL MOOC. And we've got quite an exciting group of old friends here. Um, let's go around and uh, quickly introduce yourselves <coughs> and uh, say what your role was in CL MOOC, is, was, and so forth. Chad, do you want to start with you? Just we'll go off a better. Yeah, quicker. absolutely. And by the way, oh, Google's sure. changed everything, so uh, we're we're kind of, we're we're still having fun with the technology a little bit here. But go ahead, Chad. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm Chad Sansing, and I teach language arts at a micropolitan middle school in Central Virginia. And uh, in the spirit of more CL MOOC than Halloween, uh, yeah, I'll be down here in the corner with like four weird screens doing crazy things throughout just because I just learned how to do it. So what what did you learn how to do? Go ahead. Sure. You told uh, us earlier, so but tell I us. Saw, yeah, I saw some uh, fellows, including uh, Stephen Fortune, who's pretty cool, doing some work with Forest Elephant's Mimu web app remix tool at uh, MozFest, and so I fired that up today. And that's how I got four little me's, and then I threw that through Cam Twist, which is a like a free download, and it's displaying just the the one window that Mimu is outputting to, and then I put some Cam Twist effects on it because it's like if you have a Sunday, you should put some French fries on it too, or something, you know, just keep adding things. <laughs> All right, welcome, um, Christina Cantrell. Hi. Welcome. So I put a head thing on because I was trying to see if I could do what Chad did, but obviously I can't, and now I can't take it off. So <laughs> you can't take your hat That's off. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Your cat. It's, it's a, ah, a there it is. Cat sort of I'm oh, no. Christina. I'm really jet lagged. I uh, work for the National Writing Project and work with all you folks this summer, which was fabulous and exciting. Um, and yeah, I hope I guess I guess I was one of the coordinators. I don't know. We didn't give it. I didn't have an official title. I'm on staff, and uh, got to play along, which was lovely. But you've already hit on a theme there, like do MOOCs. What kind of leadership uh, happens on MOOCs? So we'll get yeah. back to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so Joe, welcome. There you go. And by the way, the way we roll here, you don't have to mute, mute yourself unless it gets bad. Because <laughs> it's easier to interrupt without muting. No, just, we don't hear you yet, Joe. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. There you I, go. Uh, now you're on. Here you go. Go ahead. I had, uh, I had myself muted, and I had my daughters upstairs making a loud crashing noise, so I wasn't sure if you called on me or yeah. there's a minor disturbance upstairs, Wait. but I'm going to just keep on. Of the, we love environmental sounds here. Yeah, I trust my wife totally to handle whatever just happened upstairs. Uh, my role in CL MOOC was I was a co-facilitator and co-experimenter, and I think that if we're talking about roles, because I don't think we had defined roles, but there was sort of a there was sort of an insistence that different people had to play bossy pants throughout. <laughs> early on, people oh, right, right. express frustration because. Maybe there was just like too much niceness, or, or people would be hesitant to say, okay, so who's doing what? And at some point, it just kind of relaxes us all to say, please just boss me around. If you want me to do something, please just tell me. So I think we all kind of traded that hat, bossy pants, or I guess the pants. Okay. Joe, say a little more about yourself, where you hail from. Oh, I'm from Denver, the Denver Writing Project, and I work in the Aurora Public School District, which is a large urban suburb just east of Denver, and I work in educational technology there now. Cool. Thank you. Karen? Sure. Did you say Karen? me? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were going... I was just bossing you around. That's what Joe told me. <laughs> I'm 
Karen. Um, I was a CL MOOC <coughs> participant masquerading as a co-facilitator. <laughs> and I don't know. I'm here on the Arizona-New Mexico border, and I'm working on some new MOOCs, which is which CL MOOC has changed totally my idea of what a MOOC could be. So I'm thinking a lot about sort of when people make broad generalizations about MOOCs, mm -hmm. what that means or whether that makes sense, and looking forward to getting out some new resources that everybody on this panel is working on around sort of what went into CL MOOC that other people can use as they're thinking about their own online experiences. Cool. Kevin. Oh, hi, I'm uh, Kevin Hodgson, and I'm out in Western Massachusetts. Um, my whole family's watching the Red Sox in the other room, so yeah, there's going to be some yelling or crying soon. I don't know which. Um, and um, I guess my, I don't know if I had a role, but I was the unofficial welcome wagon for people. <laughs> cool. Kim. That was an important role, Kevin. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm Kim from San Diego, and um, my role in the MOOC was the, I was like the participant. I don't know, everyone else that seems to be the facilitators, but um, I was the active participant in the, in the MOOC. Yay! Yay! And, and, still is, and still is an active participant. Still is. Yeah. I am. I don't, I don't think it's over yet, so I'm still busily making things, and particularly through my blog. Every day. I try. <laughs> it's not over. It's never over. <laughs> and Kim, isn't it true that you you started your blog in CL MOOC? And that you I had, did. You hadn't blogged previously? I had not. No, I started it like 115 days ago or something like that. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's great to hear the baseball in the background, but <laughs> it's, it's very cool. Sorry, That's Karen. Right. I'm gonna mute it so you don't. I hear know. It. It's okay. I'm, like, uh, I'm recording it on delay, so don't say yeah. too much. It's <laughs> <laughs> like Kim, give a little, uh, a few other bios of uh, like what you all do. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm um, the director of the San Diego Area Writing Project, and I'm also a classroom teacher. I have a multi-age class of first, second, and third graders. Oh, well, long time no see. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so good to see you all. My name is Paul O. Oh. I work for the National Writing Project, and I am based in uh, our office in Berkeley, California. I am right now in one of my rooms in Oakland, California, where I live. And uh, I would say that I think my role for the MOOC was uh, I was I was the supreme delegator, meaning that I essentially did nothing and asked everyone if they could do things, which they all did, which was awesome. And, um, you know, the, the one thing that I would say for everyone, including Kim, uh, that I think was really interesting about our MOOC is that I would also say that every single person who was involved in the MOOC could also describe themselves as the designer of the MOOC. So, um, so I think when people talk about facilitation, that may have certain connotations, but I think um, underneath that, is, is this idea that the MOOC uh, was being designed as we were engaging in interacting with the MOOC. And um, I'd say that that was true for Kim as well. And I think uh, people could all um, describe themselves as leaders of the MOOC. So I think it goes back to that question that you raised, Paul. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, Kim played an important role as a leader as well. So those are the roles that I would put on people if they accept them. But I think that that's pretty accurate. Yeah, we could do, that. Talk about we that. Could do the old hat. Um workshop that we used to do, but on here, put hats on each other, never mind. Exactly. <laughs> Terry. Yeah, I'm, my name's Terry Elliott, and I uh, uh, tech liaison with uh, Western Kentucky University Writing Project, and I teach um, uh, at Western Kentucky University, and I spent an hour and a half today with a group of people who want to bring MOOCs to our university. And I tried to describe what we did this summer and failed miserably. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> because Say a little more. Why, do you think, why do you think you failed? We can, you know. I, I think, uh, I think it's, uh, it's about the fact that uh, it, 
if you're trying to describe something or recreate something in somebody else's mind, uh, it's almost impossible to do, especially if it's as complex and um, as as the MOOC was this summer. And uh, and I'm also finding that people uh, tend to have a very uh, vanilla view of MOOCs, as, as, that there's not a continuum of MOOCs. That, uh, at least at my university, and um, so it's hard to describe what a successful MOOC is all about, especially a successful CMOOC, because in a way, I don't, I'm not really sure you can replicate them, or you can, Im you, you can't imitate them. You can replicate them, but you can't imitate them. So that's why it was so hard. But I'm going to keep working. On it. We have a remit to do for, to spend about a half a year, and by that time, maybe MOOCs will be just the flash in the pan that some people say they are. <laughs> But I doubt it. Thanks, Zach. We invited you because you, uh, you know, Have provoked a, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, introduce yourself, please. We don't hear you yet. Uh, you gotta unmute somehow. Hmm. Well. <laughs> Very nice bow tie. Oh, you're getting there. Close. I don't hear him. We can only see the bolt. Okay. So, Zach, work on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, where do you find it? Oh, no. Well, we'll see what happens. So, uh, so if somebody is jumping in here for the first time, you guys uh, are so familiar um, with what this was, but uh, we don't want to get too far in without saying what it was. Um, who would like to take that on? Like, give some, some actual numbers and dates and what, what happened this summer. Can we start that way? I'll try to jump in, I guess, and other people Good. can kind of fill in. Um, so it was a project, um, um, a MOOC that ran over this summer um, through, you know, I don't have the right dates in my head right now, but, it, but end of June, beginning of August, roughly. Yeah. And um, it was designed to be a very open, collaborative experience for anybody who wanted to join. Um, built around the idea of connected learning principles and also the idea of the makers movement and pulling those together around hopefully educators but other people connected with teaching and learning as well um, to really kind of dive in and make things and then reflect upon that and Hopefully the third sphere of that would be then think about how that might impact their teaching in the classroom or after school program or whatever it happens to be. Um, and it was built around a series of make cycles where uh, any number of us partnered up with others to um, kind of facilitate um, projects or ideas through the course of uh, anywhere between one week to two week cycles, although a lot of them overlapped. And the idea was just to nurture creativity over the summer and allow for it to go in any direction that people needed it to go. Um, and it went off in all sorts of different directions in really interesting ways. That's as far as I remember it as a nutshell. That's good. Anybody else want to add? <laughs> I would just add that in terms of the genesis of the MOOC, I would just say that um, one thing that I think uh, sometimes um, gets forgotten is that the the origins of the MOOC really came out of um, uh, the Educator Innovator Initiative. So this, um, you know, essentially this network of networks um, that uh, really focuses on innovation and um, creativity in uh, educator spaces. Um, so, so I think that, you know, that, that was the foundational, um, or that is the foundational uh, space and ethos, I think, that then gave rise um, to the MOOC. And I would also add that I think, um, you know, the, the MOOC really was built upon the shoulders of other MOOCs that had um, preceded it um, pretty in the near and, you know, somewhat distant past. So, you know, it didn't, it didn't spring up out of isolation in that sense either. Um, so we borrowed a lot, you know, from uh, learning creative learning, and we borrowed a lot from um, from uh, from ET MOOC. So I would just, you know, give that nod as well. 
And um, maybe uh, just to sort of say that I, there was also a structure in it, even though everybody's been talking about how emergent it was, and I think it's really true that it was very emergent and sort of developed. And there were sort of these make cycles, so we can probably talk about those a little bit more, that repeated over and over again, um, yet with different content and um, inspired by different teams and what people were thinking about and the connected learning principles um, or what people were it was inspired often by what people were actually making in the previous cycle too so so these the structure of the sort of repeating cycles that are quite different um, each to the other but they have some similar structures and then we had a few stable meeting points um, in terms of technologies and gathering points and gathering moments what were the platforms it was on? So the platforms were um, the, the main hub was the NWP blog space that was in WordPress. And then much of the participation took place in a Google Plus community. And we also hosted Twitter chats. And Google Hangouts also played a role every week where with both facilitators and participants leading Hangouts. And that's, I'm sure I left something out, but those were the, the main parts. The, uh, the WordPress kind of made everything sticky and made everything stay where we wanted it to, and the Google Plus was kind of this running stream of participation and where we saw the most action, I guess. And I guess I would just add that, uh, you know, we also aggregated um, blog posts from participants. So in some senses, you know, the platforms were really varied. I mean, people were posting wherever they were going to post. Um, so, so there is that as well. All right. So just to uh, get a little organized here, I think, Zach, you're on now, right? Do you want to introduce yourself? And say, say, go ahead. Can we hear you? We were hearing you, I thought. Oh, no. This is a conspiracy. There's something between you. Oh, well. You're showing muted. Yeah. I, do we? Well, somebody want to help him work on that? <laughs> Some back channel? I don't know how to do it. Anyway, <laughs> we'll work. So, Let's. So, I'll ask one of the one of the more provocative questions Zach to ask, but but I think it's also similar to um, to what Terry was saying about how do you explain this to somebody? You guys have done a pretty good job so far, but um, you know, why do we need MOOCs? Let's start at that kind of real basic place. Don't we have Google Plus? Or I mean, I'm sorry. Don't we have Google Search? Um, you know, isn't that enough? So, is that too Zach probably would say it a little differently, but let me, <laughs> until he can get in there, I'm going to say that. Somebody want to kind of address that? Your kind of beginning question? Is the question, Sorry, why yes. do we need MOOCs? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Because we have the whole internet. Yeah, we I have mean, the internet. I, think, what? Yeah. I think one one framing for sort of the continuum of MOOCs is how much they're focused on content and content delivery versus collaboration and community and that certainly is you know ties into is is the internet enough of a MOOC so I feel like the difference at least with the connected learning MOOC was the community itself so we were learning from each other and there was content but it was also about the interactions that we had and you don't get that from just just the internet. Yeah, and I also think like uh, I know Joe talked about the different platforms. I mean, the experiences of the interactions on Twitter was very different from the experiences and in the interactions in Google Plus, which are very different from reading people's blog posts and the the RSS feed that was set up at the um, you know the main hub site. Um, and I think that idea of um, of uh, the community was bouncing across different platforms, really made it an interesting experience and, um, you know, lent itself to different kinds of projects and different kinds of sharing in ways that if we were in one little space, let's say, um, you know, it would have been very different, I think. And for me, that was really fascinating to see how different people emerge in different spaces and different projects went off in different directions depending on what that space was and, um, and how, that, how that kind of came to be. 
I'm also wondering about the um, make with me and the the sort of way the makes un some of the makes unfolded. Like people could make anything, but then there were some focus makes. I wonder if you guys think that was helpful too. Any thoughts? Well, so I'm sorry, I didn't track that question. It was about the was the make with me structure helpful? Having focus, like the the fact that the makes were an open opportunity to make, yet there were some make with me's and uh, group makes or focus makes that people worked on together too. I think the combination of like some structure and lots of flexibility, but really just a whole ethos of play and experiment and do what works for you. And I think some people took a more structured path and some people went sort of way outside. And that's, I mean, that's to me, that's unique from any other MOOC I've been involved in. I also think the encouragement to um, riff, for lack of a better word, off of other people's makes mm -hmm. was a big part of it, that you, somebody would try something and the invitation was go ahead and see what else you can do with that thing. And so there was that that um, feeling of playfulness, um, the encouragement to take a risk that there was no right or wrong answer or product or process. Mm -hmm. And yet we could help each other through it. Like, this isn't working for me. What did you do? How did you do that? Um, I thought it worked really well. It made me do things I wouldn't have done probably otherwise. And, you know, so I, I just wanted to jump in and going, going back to, I think, the original question, which is, you know, why not just um, do Google searches? I mean, I think, um, you know, an, another way to think about that question, and, and perhaps, you know, Zach, who's muted, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> would, would say that uh, really he does mean, you know, why not just have Google searches? But I think another way to think about that question is, so why a MOOC versus another kind of community of practice? You know, I mean, I think in Zach's blog post, you know, he talks about um, the kinds of personal learning networks that provide, um, you know, the, the sort of support that we might be describing. And um, I guess what I would say in response to that is I think, uh, you know, communities of practice can take many different shapes and, you know, are really um, useful to the individual depending upon, you know, their particular needs or... Uh, whatever context in which they're operating. So so I don't know that it's an either-or proposition necessarily, um, but I do think you know, that our MOOC in some ways did operate like a really huge community practice, you know, because um, there was s some sustained effort, you know, I think, um, around particular questions, and people tended to then go off, uh, I think, in their own um, sort of uh, inquiry on their own inquiry pathways, you know, and then came back together and shared what it was that they learned. So, um, so yes, I mean, you know, are, are MOOCs absolutely necessary? You know, I think, it, to me, it's not a question of are MOOCs necessary. To me, it's a question of what are the opportunities that educators have to engage in that kind of practice, um, you know, with other educators. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in this case, it seemed like there were a lot of educators who felt like, this was a successful experience for them. They felt like uh, they really gained a lot in the way that, say, for instance, Kim is describing. But, you know, that may not be the case for all educators. Others may find that, for instance, engaging in, you know, their personal learning network via Twitter is the thing that provides for them the kind of support that they need to do the kind of experimentation and engage in the kind of inquiry that they need. So, so that, that would be my response, you know, to Zach's question. Mm -hmm. Kim, can you describe, I, I think it was actually before we started uh, recording here, can you describe why this was successful for you a little more? Um, I think because it was so encouraging for one thing. I mean, so, you know, Paul's talking about how everybody was a facilitator, but I also think there were some specific roles. So Kevin said he was like the greeter. It makes a difference that somebody actually welcomes you and makes you feel like, um, whatever you put forth is worth it. So then you, you know, that kind of encouragement, and I feel like Terry played that role a lot too, that you would get that encouragement and then you would want to try something else or push it a little further um, so that it, it 
unlike a course, it didn't feel like you were doing it wrong. It felt like everything was possible. Well, that's the other thing to compare it to, right, is a course. So, and Karen, I guess you were talking about that when you're talking about content as being what other MOOCs are like. Um, yeah. Karen? <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. It's catching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, like, especially the new X MOOCs, which to me, unfortunately, have gotten to be what people mean when they say MOOCs with sort of particularly with all the media splash lately and th and they're very content heavy and they're very much traditional courses and they're much more about sort of big data and pushing people through um, and that's a really different model than a more flexible collaborative model. So are they basically um, you know videos of professors? And a lot of them are. Yeah. I mean I would say they're very and I mean even other MOOCs, it, it's really, I don't know if it's just easier if people are used to the model, but to start with sort of reading lists and video lists and video lectures and very traditionally course-like. And I think, you know, other MOOCs I've been involved in, I'm especially since CL MOOC, I'm literally pushing back against that because I think for, a, for most adult learners that are not doing this for credit, that's not what they're looking for, and it's it's a the the pushing people through a course leads to this crazy dropout rate, and I don't I don't think dropout rates are the right measure for MOOCs because I think it's about do you get out of it what you want, and in CL MOOC we are very much um, emphasized the flexibility and do what you want, and if this doesn't work, do something else, and if you don't want to be on our schedule, be on your own schedule, and whatever you do is fine, and that's very atypical for other MOOCs I've been involved in. I, I've got a great example of that, you know, the, the, the emphasis on content. Uh, when Kevin and I did the, the first week, you know, we thought, oh, man, we got this cool podcasting thing we're going to do, and we spent a lot of time and a lot of mornings working it out, and he, he and I, we've talked about this. And as soon as we let this loose, this wonderful content, everyone ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one person. But I think I, I wrote a blog post about this this week, and to mm. me, it wasn't the content, but it was that, that play, that sense of play, that sense of, you know, okay, if you don't want to do this, do something else, and what you're doing is cool. And uh, I think that's what I took away from the summer that has really stuck with me. It's just one word, is play. Because you do not find that in teacher-centered uh, uh, XMOOCs or in teacher-centered courses like uni I have at universities or in K through 12. And this, uh, the shift, it's really, it's, it really, I hate to say it, it's a, it is a paradigm shift between putting the student at the center and uh, you know, you can say that until you're blue in the face, but until you experience it, you don't know what it, what that difference really is. And I think that's what we did this summer: is that people, you know, that hang the content. What do you want to do? You know, and what do you want to share? And that's at the core of a, of CL MOOC, I think. Okay, uh, Terry, I wanted to. Um just pick up, it's reminding me how, um, I mean, we really tried to, I think as a team, um, think about connected learning as a way of designing this thing, right? And so mm -hmm. that sort of interest-driven piece was so important. So if we're going to think about interest-driven learning, we have to sort of live interest-driven learning, right? And I really mm -hmm. feel like you guys as facilitators made that happen for so many people and I just um, Paul you were one of our um, advisors on it and I believe you know you said you know it's the summer and teachers do things other than teach and sometimes have other passions and interests that they could bring to the fore so we really took that on as a reminder that you know we're all very multi-dimensional people and what could the summer be like if we were really driven by our interest paths? So I thought that was really exciting to see come alive um, in the MOOC. One thing that I might add is that I think that when we talk about MOOCs taking on like sort of 
the form of a traditional course, even though it's happening in a network space, maybe, um, is that really it took us a while to determine what the alter what our alternative to that would look like, and even then, it took shape during the move. Yeah. And so I think one of the one of the things that made us unique, and maybe only the facilitators are aware that we might be the only MOOC in history that had a designated role of a hologram. <laughs> one facilitator who played the role of a hologram. So I think maybe Chad should speak a little bit about the role of the hologram and what the hologram looks for when he's scouring the MOOC. Um, yeah, sure. Hopefully I'm, I'm unmuted now. Yeah, we um, hear you. I don't know. So the hologram was like my attempt to... Uh, just be of use in as many different uh, cycles and makes and ways possible without uh, getting caught up in like the the formalized structures we were working on. Like I wanted to contribute to those, but not have any kind of uh, authority or responsibility for like saying, you know, this is how this will be. I don't know. It's not, uh, that idea of play. I thought that would be a good role for me to take. Um, and I think many of the questions and comments that we've been listening to and making in the, over the past, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes go back to, like, Zach's, Zach's question, the implied question, the question we've been talking about, like, why not just the Internet? And I think play is part of it. I think people is part of it. I mean, be like, why, why bother with the Internet? We already had people. But, you know, ideally the, what the Internet does is it, it brings us together in ways that were difficult to achieve before. And so if we're looking at, like, MOOCs, if we're looking at a MOOC like CL MOOC, does that help bring people together to learn together in a way that maybe isn't routinely sanctioned or offered by school? Like, why CL MOOC? We already have professional development. Yeah, it's because it does it differently. You know, why? It's because participatory learning is different than a delivery model learning. So, you know, the question about kind of MOOCs that deliver content or that are for, you know, profit or very uh, teacher-driven, uh, not that all those things are the same or all happen together all the time, uh, but, you know, like for me, it's like, do we need MOOCs like that is the same question as do we need schools like that? And you know, hopefully the answer is like no, and we do things like CL MOOC and mess around with the format and structures of what we think public education in particular should be and keep changing things around. So, you know, I mean, like, it, it, it's a very, I don't know, it's just a very human way to learn, to play, and to remind ourselves that that's something we can do and that learning can come from it. Uh, we forget that all the time, especially as adults and adult learners. And, you know, I would never say, like, why, why do I need to hang out with Zach uh, and have a bagel with him at Educon or something? because I can already read his bagel reviews on, you know, Bagelster or whatever on the Internet. That's not, that's not the same experience. Uh, and certainly, like, reading what Zach thinks about MOOCs or uh, bagels on a blog or a service online, it's not the same as, like, sitting around with him and talking or doing, like, the, you know, the thing with the bagels and forks and making them dance. It's just not the same. So I think we need all of these kind of participatory learning experiences locally and online to remind ourselves that the stuff exists because of people, and people try things out. And that's a, that's a better way to learn than to proceed from a place of certainty where you prevent people from trying things out because you're positive that what you're about to give them takes care of the problem. I mean, that's not, that's not the true nature of the Internet. So I think one of the really exciting things about CL MOOC is that it made some people think differently about the model of MOOCs and about a different model of learning, not just for us, but for everybody. And, and I'm interested in sort of how, how to move that ahead more, particularly in light of how difficult it seems to explain to people what this other model is. And I think it is difficult because it's not, like everybody can describe a course. It's really, you just say the word and people know what you mean, and it's very like box-like. Um, and I hope if Chris comes back that he, he's working on a new online experience and I hope he can talk about sort of how he's thinking about things and w what the resistance is and maybe Terry you know you could talk about it at your school or other people like what's the way to sort of convey... And you Karen, you're, you're also doing that aren't you? I mean, I'm trying but I think it's challenging. <laughs> I, I think so I'm working on a couple 
a couple new MOOCs, as well as my work with Peer-to-Peer -peer University. And I think that it's it's always hard. It's hard to explain. And sometimes, I, you know, I'll say one thing I found at, at P2PU is sometimes learners have pushed back against something mm -hmm. that's not a course. And I think we were, we were just really fortunate in CL MOOC to have a community that just embraced the sort of messiness of what we were doing. I've certainly been in other groups where, you know, I'm trying to model peer learning and they're going, we want the expert to tell us <laughs> X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z. And it, it, that's challenging. I also wonder how the um, connected learning principles, which for me that was that was the point of CL MOOC was to mm. unpack those principles through the experience. So not have somebody tell me what they meant. And I've been having people tell me what they meant. But until I actually, through the experiences, could connect to them and say, now I really get what me what it means to be peer supported and academically oriented, even though I'm actually feel like I'm playing, um, made it made a big difference for me. And so to me, that was the content of the MOOC was the of our CL MOOC was the um, connected learning principles, and then the experiences helped me make sense of them in a way that I hadn't made sense of them through my quote study that I'd done previously. I don't know if that makes sense, but that keeps going through my head that that was really what I thought I was um, doing when I participated in the MOOC. And I don't know that I realized it during each make, but the more I participated, I was able to articulate my understanding of those principles that I couldn't actually do before. You know, and I, I just wanted to say quickly, um, you know, that I think uh, alongside that, um, you know, what Kim was just describing, I think also the idea and the focus on making. So I think, you know, making includes um, the, the really eloquent, uh, you know, notion of play that, that Chad articulated. But I think that the, the idea of making uh, was, um, you know, was critical, um, obviously because people were making things, and that was the point of our MOOC. But I think it it forced us really to consider, like, you know, this this idea of play and you know the way in which we would interact to facilitate making. And I would say that for those of us who helped design the MOOC itself, you know, we were we were we made this thing. Um, and so I think that that in and of itself was a really um, generative process. And so unlike you know say course-like MOOCs, um, where essentially what you're making is you know some content that you're putting into a container, I think you know we were making a design and we were making we were actually making you know platforms in some cases in you know open source spaces. Um, so I think we all took on that ethos. Um, and, and I think that's part of uh, what was really interesting and, and one way to perhaps describe at least this particular MOOC. I don't know. I mean, it, it, you know, it, uh, I'm not sure if it's an apt description for you know, all connectivist MOOCs, but it does seem like there is this element of being a producer, being a, co a constructor, you know, a builder, a maker um, that ties some of these connectivist MOOCs together. So as our as articulate as you all have been, I'm, it, it makes me wonder a little bit, uh, you know. So what one one thing Kim just said, just to repeat, and is that the making was the content, right? So so there was there was a nice mix of that. It reminds me of all the studies of online education that at least at first were all about technology classes. So, you know, then when they you moved out to other things, things had to change. So can you do a MOOC that is in process and making and it be about something else? Like you were lucky to have a MOOC that was about what you were doing. Does that, does that make sense? So I think that's what's hard to kind of imagine a little bit. Do you all, do you all remember having the discussion early on about whether we were going to background or foreground 
the CEO principles. Do you all remember yeah, that? Yeah, it's an important, yeah. And then that question just resolved itself. It became a, a total non-issue after the MOOC started. And I just found that to be just fascinating how it no longer mattered anymore. Uh, that I mean, we had this content. We were going to push it out there. But it seemed to me like there was something uh, there was something else driving us. Uh, something maybe it's the writing project ethos. Maybe it's progressive education. Maybe it's just something as simple as people who love technology. You know, there's a lot of there are a lot of threads that went into this. That uh, including last August when we several of us got together for Connected Educator Month, um, and it's not. You know, you don't tease stuff like that out without killing it. As I said in my blog post, that I'm afraid to be too descriptive because I might love love the CL MOOC to death. You know, we dissect something, uh, we take it apart, we analyze it to death, and I, you know, I worry about that. I would, I had some things in that I think that people can take away from the MOOC, but. It's like every other complex thing, you know, you might start with the same initial conditions, but I guarantee you, you wouldn't get the same MOOC, you know, you just wouldn't because the people are different and what people bring to it are different, which isn't to say you shouldn't try, but, you know, that's, I mean, we had this discussion early on, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> So, any other thoughts on? Um, <laughs> I'm going to press it a little, one, one more time. So, so if your content is, I don't know, you know, global warming or something, um, you know, then you have another kind of burden. It seems to me, in, in the MOOC. Well, and I think the one thing I'm, I might add is that having participated in a few connectivist MOOCs prior to this, I think that when when you're communicating to a, to a large group of participants that their interaction is where their learning is going to come from, mm -hmm. then you can establish all types of questions or themes for their, you know, to, to kind of frame some of the learning. I do think that, that does a lot of, that starts to establish a tone where people are going to make discoveries and maybe support one another in taking risks that might be kind of, you know, withstand some different content. I don't know about global warming, but probably global warming. If you if you assert at the at the outset that there may be experts coming and going throughout this course, but the participation and the meaning making you do in blogging and reacting and reflecting is where the learning is going to come from. I think that's a pretty nice stance to take and it's I think those are the types of MOOCs that I've always been interested in and I'm glad that I think we I mean we had some interesting things to say about that in terms of our design. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I think I, that like... Oh, go ahead, Chad. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, like with any content, teaching any content, I don't know, I want to believe that it's effective and, and cool to do, you know, that kind of... where you, you start with something, whether it's a a toy hack or a altered reality game or, you know, whatever activity you set up that you, you create this kind of engaging environment for people to do something and then through questioning and through setting up the reflection activity the learners discover the connections for themselves. Like, I, I think that's a pretty powerful setup uh, regardless of context for learning. So, like, you know, I think about teaching the web with analog games and, and toys and tools and puzzles. I think, it, you know, particular to, like, global warming, like, could you set up a playful and participatory experience to get that content across? Yeah, absolutely. And, like, um, I think about Antero Garcia's, right, Black Cloud game, like, that he ran in, in Los Angeles with uh, just... Uh, <laughs> his stories about that are... Like that's like really gonzo teaching, um, but it taught. 
I think with any any piece of content, um, I suppose if you get really totally super technical, if you if you have a high level of expertise, if you're doing very very specialized work, there are some things you're going to want to get and get right. But on the way there, you know, knowing why you have to get those things right, I mean, you've got to do some meeting making and connecting somewhere along the line to understand the patterns and the structures and the things that underlie what it is you're doing and why it matters so much. And I just think participating uh, rather than waiting and receiving something that's strictly kind of delivered for you to consume in a, an industrial model uh, is not the way to go. You know, I, I'm going to jump off, um, but I just wanted to say quickly that, um, you know, one one aspect of CLMOOC uh, that I think was touched on early on was the idea that um, the educators involved would um, somehow take uh, their experience and you know, remix it in their own uh, learning contexts. And uh, I just want to say that uh, I had the opportunity to look at some reflections by uh, a group of writing project um, educators who, who uh, took on this particular role called Connected Learning Liaison, and a number of them participated in CLMOOC. And uh, one thing that was gratifying, and you know, I wanted to share this with all the facilitators, is that I think that that work is happening. Um, I think uh, and I think a lot of it was powered by, you know, some of the notions around uh, making and the agency involved and, and uh, what that might mean, you know, um, to give youth opportunities um, to have that same level of um, self-direction, you know, that the adults themselves experienced in the MOOC. Um, so, so I think that was, you know, it's really amazing to read. Um, you know, in one case, a guy who's a technologist who essentially you know, was really focused on the tools that he taught to other adults, you know, in terms of PD, um, who then realized that actually that wasn't the point. You know, that was because of the experiences that he had um, in CLMOOC to another teacher who, uh, with her fifth graders, is going to take them out and have them make boats um, to, you know, to test out on the, the river behind her school. So, uh, you know, whether, I mean, that is not necessarily the point of all MOOCs, but I would say it was a thing that we wanted to see happen, and, you know, I think those are at least some examples of, of the fact that that is happening. And, uh, you know, and I think that's pretty cool and pretty awesome. Hmm. So I'm going to jump off because I Thanks. think Anna is Thanks trying to get on. Great. Thanks for being here. Okay. Well, I think that's great to hear. I was going to say that, uh, you know, that's great to hear because I think one of the you know, one of, I don't know, weakness is the right word, but the, like, the follow-up of, like, the, the longer impact, I think, of the summer is hard to judge, you know. Um, and, I mean, I know that I get, um, you know, I, I still have connections with a lot of people who say, yeah, we, you know, I kind of lurked all summer long. <laughs> you know, watch what you were all doing, and, you know, it was really interesting. I just wasn't ready to jump in, and but I see a little kind of light over here and there, um, but it's hard, it's hard to know what those kind of reverberations are and the impact of it. And you just have to trust, I think, that somewhere down the line, things are going to stick with some people and hopefully make a um, make an impact on the students in their classrooms or their educational experience. Uh, is Christopher, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello? You have to unmute to do that. Can I unmute him? <laughs> what is the mute thing going on here? I don't know. Tonight, whatever. Um, might be a, one of the changes in Google. Could be. So uh, if you're uh, in the chat room and you want to join us, we have a uh, room here. <laughs> we just scared Christopher away, but that's okay. Um, so uh, what were you hoping to talk about here tonight that we haven't covered yet? Let's try that. Terry, you have any thoughts on that? Or Chad, or anybody. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I like, yeah. you know, yeah, just... I think um, a certain amount of like uh, putting just putting stuff out there, and, and like uh, as Terry described, and his work with Kevin in podcasting, or um, and I think back to. Attempting a toy hack on camera during a during one of our our make with me's instead of like putting the camera on on my face. Like I just think about 
like really showing the doing, really showing the making, really just uh, people at in, in every role, like even if it's a flat kind of non-leveled experience, people in every role trying things and willing to be a little bit silly uh, and making that silliness safe is important uh, to, to a learning experience like CL MOOC. Nice motto, making silliness safe. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, do you want to hey, you know. introduce yourself and tell us? Good. You were able to unmute. <laughs> Hi there. Sure. I'm Anna. I'm not sure what the conversation has been, so I don't want to... Um, it's okay. Any toy, toy. Just I what was, was you, what, what's your reflections on the summer? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I literally, I just ran in here. I've been, like, I was teaching and then another meeting and ran in here, so I'd like to just listen even for a little That's bit fine. longer. I, was th I guess I have one thought um, that just popped up just from what was said in the last few minutes um, when I've been here is the, um, and again, I don't know if you've already talked about this, but thinking about the difference between um, the the platforms we use, right, the software and technology side that we use to make the, the MOOC happen and the practices that we established as a group. Um, so things like... Um, like the the commenting on each other's blogs and in, in ways that both um, you know recognized that it something had been read, and but then also like um, questioned and drove the person to the next step or to got them another resource. Um, the practice of like um, the find five Fridays, right? The people took some time on on you know a day to look at other people's works, and I, I've seen some of those things continue. And um, like, like also the, the make with me idea, right? That there are people that are coming together to, to make and write and collaborate at the same time, even if they're working on different projects. I've seen some people take up some of those practices that we, we I guess, that, that emerged from the way we were doing in the summer. Um, and I think that's something interesting to think about, um, that there's the, there's the formal kind of um, support and... and um, ways to sustain something after a course or a, collect, a collaborative kind of thing like we were doing. But then there's these more informal things that do are actually extending out um, from, the, from the summer. Just a thought. Yeah. We did talk a little about platforms, but I think those are all really, um, you know, things to kind of keep in mind, too. If, you know, if we're thinking uh, part of what I know Karen is doing is trying to pull together some resources and not to replicate the CL MOOC, uh, but to kind of maybe show the path that we took and um, and then hopefully somebody will remix that all and kind of make a, a another experience for people that will be meaningful too. Um, and so part of what we're still doing, I think, is trying to share out our own thinking about what what happened and and what worked and what didn't work. Because there's you know there are things that didn't work too. I think probably. Um, um, and just the unexpected. I think, you know, that was the great part for me is that everything, even though, you know, we had a kind of general plan, so much emerged that was completely unexpected. You know, we had hoped that some people would emerge as leaders in the spaces, and, you know, a lot of them did and said, hey, you know, we're going to take this idea and go off in this direction, and suddenly, you know, everyone's doing binds <laughs> or, um, you know, uh, or memes go off in another direction, and you know, just kind of things that we hadn't even considered suddenly were kind of emerging there and, and taking hold. And I thought that was really that was a powerful part for me that a lot of it stemmed from the center, um, you know, of the uh, the participants. Um, I, I think just, that oh, it's okay. Go ahead. I was I was just going to add with that too is I I, I think also um, Paul that part, or not Paul sorry <laughs> Kevin <laughs> part of that planning I was thinking of the word planning part of part of what was planned about though was to follow people where they went and and to let right the emergent be the you know the what we followed as as facilitators so in terms of like no, we didn't plan for specific things to happen and specific kinds of ways of, of making to happen and, and, and composition to happen in the summer, but we did plan to follow people. And, and so I think as we put together, you know, lists of resources and platforms and tools, I think practices and the, the purposes that were, that were driving those things, I think, also need to be gathered. So Anna, wow, 
Are you allowed to have an idea that doesn't start with a P tonight, though? That's what I want to think. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about that. <laughs> That's why I, I stopped. I said purposes and I said sentences and purposes, and I was going to say because we had talked about the like the ethos of National Writing Project, <laughs> but it didn't start with a P, so I didn't say it. <laughs> just well, let me just pick up on that for a second. I did want to say, and if Chris gets on here, I'd be interested too. I just want to remember. And I know we all know this, but I just want to say it out loud, that we're all part of these communities of practice also that are next to, connected to, intertwined with the MOOC in different ways. And so to me what's really exciting is sort of where how the summer starts to build into those things too. Um, and, uh, you know, Chris is, for one example, I know they're building something that been, were inspired to talk with you guys all in Seattle. And um, I know that there are other things happening around the country. Um, Mia Zamora, for one, um, has been taking her experience and working in her local community. So I think we're going to start to hear and see more of that, too, in different ways. That's going to be really interesting to look back at over time. So, Chris, Christopher, can you speak? We can't see yet. Uh, nope, there you are. Yes. We see you now. Nope. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> we hope he, he gets in here. I, I, I want to use Terry's example of talking to people at his university about MOOCs and just ask if you, in your kind of final thoughts here tonight, could give him some advice about how would you just how would you do this? If you had some time, how would you describe what this thing is? And based on our discussion tonight, what, what would you emphasize? I think one thing that I just like to jump in and talk about was that because I've reflected on it a little bit is during the planning. Anytime we came up with an innovative idea, whether it was, I, I, and maybe they weren't even innovative ideas, but anytime we had an idea for a way to facilitate or a way people might participate, I think that we coupled that same sort of idea with this question of how are we going to support people who otherwise wouldn't be able to participate or know about, for example, a Twitter chat or be able to access a Google Hangout. So, you know, who knows how we ended up doing with the equity piece, but I would say that that was at the forefront of our planning was that every every bright idea was coupled with how do we support people so they feel like invited and encouraged and that they're on the right track and in the right place even as even as this thing starts to shift in direction or or take on you know unexpected unexpected shapes and I would question whether I would wonder how often that's part of the planning at a university level who's where they're wanting to leverage MOOCs. Uh, you know what? I'm just going <laughs> to... Who wants to speak next? Chad, any final thoughts here tonight? Uh, yeah, like my, my eternal quest is just to always get people into a hack jam because once they do a hack jam or two, they kind of... By the end of it, they they start asking the right questions and. So you know, that's how well, you would have the com the hour and a half. You would uh, do a hack jam with them. Yeah. If I could persuade people of the <laughs> let's talk about MOOCs at this university level to hack jam, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Chad, they they all wanted to talk about today about how to fit in uh, MOOCs into uh, uh, tenure portfolio. So. Oh, God. That's a, that's a fun thing to hack. That's a non-starter. Hack the tenure portfolio, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Those, those people portfolio. want to preserve <laughs> tenure? Don't they want to hack tenure anyway? Come on. <laughs> no, they don't They don't want to hack tenure. <laughs> this is a bunch of faculty. I didn't say it was a good answer. It's just Chris, answer. are you on no, now? I, I, I think I am. Yeah, you are. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Christopher, mm -hmm. we're, we're going to give you the out here. <laughs> Um, meaning, meaning that, tell us what you're planning to do. Where, where um, my to, plan or is... Introduce uh, yourself a little bit first, please. Sorry. My name is Christopher. I'm from Boise, Boise State Running Project and the Idaho State Department of Education. And 
I last summer worked with the Boise State Writing Project folks on an online learning experience involving informational text. And we did a very full rendition of an online course. And while I learned some stuff from doing it, I was not as excited about it as I was when I stumbled to CCL Meet this summer. And we're doing another rendition of that um, this spring, starting in January. And we're going to do uh, eight weeks. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna do some more planning, but roughly what we have is more make cycles. And we were thinking about having each make cycle center on a different informational text. Uh, we're basing it somewhat on the work of Jeff Wilhelm, and he has a book. Uh, I think the title is Oh Yeah, or so, oh, so What, um, and it's about different types of informational text. We were thinking about each cycle being centered on one, so. One I was thinking about was list. Another one was uh, like process description, so kind of describing how to make something. And um, I'm all ears for suggestions from there. But I also want to give a big thank you to everybody that's on this team so far for for mentoring us through the process to get them a lot more. But we got most about this than I have about on my last. I don't know. I think a lot. This is really cheesy, but I think a lot is of what this comes down to is what Terry was saying is about personal relationships. And it's just been everybody's been very personable towards me and that's made it really easy to get involved. So that's what she said. Super, you added two more P's, process and personal relationships. So thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, any other thoughts here as we're closing <clears throat> that you want to jump in on? Well, I think, um, if you don't mind me saying, so I, Kevin, mean, go ahead, yeah. I, I think a lot, I mean, a lot of it was so positive. Um, you know, one area I kind of still think about and wonder, and I think Joe mentioned it too, is the idea of, um, you know, how to reach more diverse um, populations of teachers um, that I'm not sure we did, you know, we really kind of did that so much. And I don't know what we could have done different either, really, but I think it's one of those things to kind of think about. Uh, if anybody is going to try to, you know, kind of move in a similar direction is um, how to get the invites out to people that are not really in your networks to begin with and how to pull more of those people in. Um, and I think we did have a lot of people that we didn't necessarily know, but uh, for me it felt like, uh, I don't know, maybe nobody else felt that way, but I felt like the equity part of it, we didn't quite kind of get where we needed to be. I feel like the point that you're making about the diversity, I feel like I could I could get more people to participate now that I actually have a sense of what I'm asking them to do, what what they might experience so that it wouldn't be so scary because I know when I was inviting people they're like oh my gosh you can't even really explain this so how can I possibly participate <laughs> and so I feel like now that I have a better sense of what I got out of it that I could actually um, encourage people I could I could mentor them to give it a give it a shot and I think it wouldn't be so so scary um, as it was, I mean, the fact that I got Janice and Barb to participate at all was a huge, um, a huge step. But I could, I could do that probably times ten now because they could help me, and I just have a sense of what it is. And I think that's an important piece. Like, so, I, Kevin, I think you're, you're wanting it to be more diverse is is wonderful. But until we kind of have a way to help people, you know, stick their toe in it. Um, because we have a sense of how that feels and we can make it safe for them. I think that's part of it. Yeah. Makes sense. I want to give, uh, just at the end here, Karen, if you don't mind, a chance to sort of talk about your next MOOC again, just and how people might work with you around that. Sure. And I do, I really agree with what Kim just said about now that we've all been through this, and I mean a whole lot of people, not you know, not just right. the facilitators, but we kind of, I mean, I think we could do this like bigger and better, and it's just everything's an evolution. But we did some experiments with face-to-face -face groups around CL MOOC, and I think they didn't go exactly the way I was hoping. It, but it gave me insight into 
how big and scary this can be to people who just don't even know what a MOOC is and, and, and just all the issues around that. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's some really exciting potential to do to do work around, particularly around face-to-face -face groups and sort of a hybrid model. Um, so there's a couple projects that I'm working on really, just I'll say quickly. One is uh, not really a MOOC because it's I don't anticipate it to be massive, but I feel good about that. <laughs> and it's it's very is it much... massively open? That's <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's massively open. Okay, um, right. it, is, it is very much a remix and spinoff of CL MOOC, and it's called Make Hack Play Together. And I know Christopher signed up for that, which I'm very excited about. And it actually starts on Monday, and it is it is a much scaled down um, version. I, I don't even say it's a version of CL MOOC, but inspired by CL MOOC around Make Hack Play. It's three weeks and sort of very make stuff centered. Um, and the other one I'm working on is at a it probably will be massive and is at a much earlier stage, um, but it's around deeper learning principles, um, co-produced with High Tech High, PDPU, and Media Lab. And it there's a we're doing a preview week next week around academic mindsets. If people are interested in that topic, tune into that. Um, and then it starts not till January. Cool. So that's what I'm working on, among other things. So we should give you all all of us a break. I do want to mention digital is as um, as you know in a way that's an ongoing MOOC. <laughs> um, so and and how it is and it isn't is an interesting question too. But certainly that would be an interesting place to play off of. Is there anything else that anybody wants to mention as we close out that is moving out from the MOOC? I'll just it's mention like that there yeah. is there is a make a MOOC reflections on CL MOOC collection happening at Digital Is right everyone and it will be in the next couple weeks it will be up so if people are interested in more everything from reflections on the ethos to discussions of the platforms we used um, and we hope that that will be remixed and people will add to that as well. And the practices and processes and all the other things. all the P's, <laughs> all the P's. And there's also a um, a group yeah. is sharing at the annual meeting too, right? Is that you, Joe and Kevin? Kevin, right? Very cool. Yeah. So okay. another right. thing though that I want to throw in here is sure. panacea, <laughs> and I just that I think that's another no note to think about that I don't think MOOCs are the end all be all about the ways that we collaborate now and that right and the ways that, that we um, communicate and come together around a central topic I'm um, just I mean there were things way before MOOCs that if they would happen now they would be called MOOCs and I and so it, I think it's a it's a concept that um, that we need to decide how important it is that right why is this the word we're using now and is is this the only way that we can talk about these things just like you said right digital is is a, is a collaborative space um, but you know what, what is and is doesn't make it um, a MOOC, and is that where we need to put our attention right now? Is whether or not we're having MOOCs. Um, way before this, we had wikis that people built together, and in a lot of those were right were collaborative courses on topics. Um, so anyway, just uh, and massive and open and online, <laughs> right? So um, just thinking about that. Panacea, last P word for tonight. Thank you. Brought to you by our sponsor. Thank you. And um, just want to <laughs> say that you're welcome to come back to this MOOC, which is Teachers Teaching Teachers, <laughs> every Wednesday here. Um, and uh, we want to thank Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier um, for helping set that up uh, several years ago. And thank you all for your conversation tonight. We'll say good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank you.